Borneo, natural habitat of orangutans. There are about 20,000 orangutans in the world. Orangutan is a word often used for Malays, and it also means forest dweller. On a journey through Sarawak in western Borneo, one may come across indigenous forest people. For centuries, the Iban tribe was known for bloody headhunting. But nowadays, you have no reason to fear their wrath. The last head rolled in these parts in 1946. A British colonial governor forbade the tradition. And today, Iban tribe members welcome tourists with a warm smile in place of a spear. Pirates, Si Pa Chao, were notoriously dangerous. They emigrated from the southern Philippines 200 years ago. Sipa Chao lived on the mangrove coast, or dog's coast, in houses made of silt, the so-called kampung air. With no electricity or plumbing, the pirates lived a meagre existence. There is a wide range of products available at the markets. Seafood, various breeds of cattle, domestic animals, and, often the case, fake Rolexes. And nothing is missing in these breathtaking attractions. The religious world of Malaysia is as diverse as the articles peddled at the local markets. 53% of the population is Muslim, Many inhabitants with Chinese origins keep the Buddhist faith, and there are also numerous Hindus and Christians. Malaysia has a fascinating 4,800 kilometers of coastline. Sunbathers come throughout the year, and with an average of 24 degrees, they are rarely disappointed with the weather. The dramatic 452-metre-tall Petronas Twin Towers are the symbol of the city. About 1.5 million people participate in the dynamic modern life of the metropolis. Malaysia ranks among the most ambitious and powerful economies in Southeast Asia. Skyscrapers shoot up to the heavens, and favourable export rates boost local markets. Kuala Lumpur is an important reference point for both IT branches and the world of international finance. With all the modernization of high-tech Kuala Lumpur, the city has not forgotten its traditional roots. The Malaysians still have a king, and consider his grandiose palace worth every penny they spend in taxes to keep up his lifestyle. A true Malay is a patriot. A strong shared national pride brings people from different races together. Although the majority of the population is Muslim, religious freedom is fully guaranteed in the constitution. Kuala Lumpur is a melting pot of cultures. This mix of races and religions makes good sense of East and West. Malay women are slowly discovering the advantages of Western society. Pavrin feels comfortable in the liberal atmosphere of the metropolis. I love KL a lot as I can't imagine to stay outside of Malaysia. It's a city full of entertainment and lifestyle is that very good. As well as the people around Chinese, Indian, Malays and etc. Twenty-six-year-old Pavrin is not the only one who finds the Suraya KLCC shopping center in the Petronas Twin Towers a magical attraction. Every day, droves of people flock to shop in this shopping center. Tourists profit from bargain prices. Malaysia is a duty-free El Dorado. In the capital, the program Vision 2020 is close to being accomplished. Malaysia hopes to climb into the top league of high-tech states. Even the Asian economic crisis in 1997 could not stop the country's upswing. Jumping from the 73rd floor of Petronas Twin Towers, not exactly a safe sport.
But for adrenaline junkies, it's the biggest kick of their lives. The World Base Jumping Championships took place here on the 2001 Celebration of Independence. The excitement reaches its highest point between four to six seconds of free fall, just before the parachute opens. And you go for the... <laughs> I see a lot of people also... <laughs> Aziz is the only Malaysian among the 50 participants. There are anywhere from 300 to 500 base jumpers worldwide. There's not always time for basic preparation, as a lot of jumps are illegal. But at the World Championships, everything that goes on is under control. The jury's criteria are jump length, parachute angle as it opens, and landing precision. Referee Franz Eckervogt knows the exceptional dangers involved. In a plane, you're about 4,000 meters up, but here you're much closer to the ground. That means that during a fall, even at high speeds, you have a lot more time to react. On the other hand, here you have to be fast to avoid mistakes and you have, in all, a lot less leeway. This is already a jump of deadly proportions, 300 meter free fall at a speed of 100 kilometers an hour. This jump didn't end too badly, just a broken leg, as was later diagnosed. Even though the 46-year-old is a pilot, he remains extremely tense until the jump. <laughs> oh yeah, I am excited, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, you know, everything. Excited. Anxious. While the competition falls into place, Aziz prepares himself for action. A last check of the parachute and the competition gets underway. For Aziz, it's the last jump of the competition. Even if he didn't win first place, it's still a success for him, as he managed to get through to the last round. The jump was excellent, and all the strain of the past six competition days is now forgotten. Yeah, I have a good feeling. You know, I've done it 12 rounds and I'm still alive. What else can you ask? <laughs> <laughs> Aziz isn't one of the first in the competition, he was just one before the last. Yet he is a real hero for his Malaysian fans, because to be in the competition means everything. In Malaysia there are 125 different bathing areas. The most beautiful ones are on the east coast of the Borneo Islands. The warm, clear water provides for rich marine fauna and flora. Over 3,000 different animal species live here. Among them, you will find seven different kinds of shark. You can discover the habitat reef at a distance of 2,000 kilometers. The apparent idyll has its shady sides. For centuries, pirates have been a nuisance in the Celebes Lake and continue to prey in modern times. You should inform yourself, therefore, before travel about the current security situation. The mainland is approximately 40 kilometers away, one hour with a speedboat. Most tourists stay on Pulau Sipadan for several days. Stress is an unknown word here. Whether you choose an active vacation, diving or exclusive trips, Depending on the season, you will pay up to 200 euros per day. At least three diving activities are possible each day. And for those who don't own their own equipment, local hiring services are available. Early booking is advisable, as the few huts of the small island are often booked months in advance. The island offers delightful walks, and you can walk all round it in 20 minutes. Like Kim, all diving teachers are natives, and before every trip, he gives a talk about the sensitive ecological reef system. Okay, if everyone is ready, let's go. Each diving teacher gets a group of seven students on board, so Kim can dedicate himself to each and every diver personally. The diving pleasure begins just a few minutes away from the beach. Every time they dive, people see a multitude of turtles, mostly green sea turtles. Years ago, they numbered in the millions, but as they were considered to be a favorite dish, usually ended up in the cooking pot. The 
The islands in the Sulu Sea are one of the most important turtle breeding grounds in Southeast Asia. The animals come to the beach at night to make their nests. Nobody knows exactly when. The females return about every three years to their birthplace to lay their eggs. Since 1997, the nature reserve of Turtle Island and its animals have been protected under preservation statutes. The laying of eggs lasts about eight hours. For the reptiles and cameramen, that certainly appears to be a stressful act of nature. To protect the turtle eggs from natural enemies, rangers often dig them out of the sand. Turtle females, under the heavy load of their shell, drag themselves back to the sea, completely exhausted. The eggs are usually put into an artificial nest within a guarded enclosure. Three months later, the small turtles slip out. The nest temperature is the crucial factor for gender differentiation. For example, a warmer nest will create more females. 84 turtle babies see the light of day here at the artificial nest. Upper Ranger Karim is happy with the breeding with 90% of all births successful. The young find their way straight to the sea without help. They instinctively orientate themselves by the Earth's magnetic field. In over 20 years, Ranger Karim has escorted quite a few generations. Probably this hatchling been released now. Uh, we wait for another 20 years. By, by the time, probably, I'll be retired. Yeah? But, but actually, this conservation is for our future generation. From the beginning, they are exposed to dangers. The death rate is the highest in the first year. The ones that survive the shallow water swim non-stop for a week without food or sleep. 2% of the young animals survive this strain. The Iban tribe lives alongside the vast rivers of West Borneo. A long way from any civilization, Low in the green thicket of the rainforest are the first villages. In the past, the Iban tribe was feared as headhunters. Each captured head meant glory and honor, following the spiritual belief. Gayam himself has never captured any heads, but his father was a famous headhunter. Iban means original traveler. A lot of Iban tribe members travel. We're a nation of travelers. We also travel to prove ourselves. The one who comes home after a long trip is respected by everyone in the village. Nobody has to row anymore. The Iban tribe profit from technical progress. For 15 years, they have been using motorboats. Gayam has traveled around. He has been all over Borneo. He's worked on an oil rig in the neighboring country of Brunei. Nobody knows how old Gayam is, but he's definitely reached 60. We from the Iban tribe have a tradition. After each trip, we tattoo ourselves so we can remind ourselves of the different places and so we can show where we've been. The sign on our bodies should show our younger generations so they carry on with it. Not everyone will want to, but it's still our tradition. Everybody enjoys the television, and it's become a status symbol even if there is no electricity. Batteries are enough. In the Iban tribe, men and women have equal rights. Both work seven days a week. There are no vacation dates, and women are the first to rise. Meat is considered a luxury and is eaten just once a week. Rubber, cocoa, and pepper are the most important revenue sources. A pepper plantation lies on the hills surrounding the settlement. Malaysia is one of the world's largest pepper suppliers. 90% of the country's pepper is cultivated in Sarawak. The pepper is harvested once a year. It is hard work, but well worth the effort. Malaysia's pepper is in high demand around the world. A kilo of dried peppers yields a profit of one euro at the market. To local standards, this is a tidy sum. The center of social life is the traditional cottage. Around 200 people live and work peacefully under one roof. 
Young men prefer to stay in the villages, appreciating the traditional community life, as Chieftain Juan notes. They are allowed to stay in the cottage overnight. Tourism is one of the village's most important revenue sources. Dance performances and arts and crafts attract tourists and profits, both highly admired among visitors. We feel very good here. Most of the time we're busy, and we're always surrounded by people. It is never boring. In the jungle we find everything we need to survive. It's like a supermarket. We find life here much better than any big city. I'm not aware of the future, but I imagine life will pretty much stay the same. The only thing that makes a difference is whether we want to live in a more modern way or stick to a traditional way of life. An intense commercial chatter flows between the natives. All Iban houses have the distinguishing feature of an oblong interior. Families in a position of power usually live in the center of the settlement. Today, the Iban tribe members use gas to cook, a big help in everyday life. Their basic food is rice. On special holidays, the meals are more sumptuous, especially at a wedding. The event preparations are running at full speed. Everything has to be done. Not easy with traditional costumes, which consist of many individual parts. But the bride and groom should be perfect. The whole community is in a festive mood and is looking forward to the ceremonies. In the past, the bridegroom offered a shrunken head as dowry. Today, just throwing the betel nut is enough. When both halves fall at once, destiny will be kind to Rini and Dunda. Ring exchange is not a custom of the Iban tribe, but is practiced in modern couples. As a high point of the wedding ritual, the chief of the nave flails a chicken to request God's blessing for the young couple. If the first rice wine flows, the temperature rises. The traditional brew is never missing from an Iban celebration, but be careful. The fermented wine has a high alcohol content. <laughs> the newlyweds must fill the glasses again and again, as is the custom. There is one golden rule. As long as there is rice wine left, the wedding party goes on. Today, the Iban tribe counts as one of the world's largest indigenous groups, with a population of 600,000. The precious few have carried on the tradition of the blowing tube. It is becoming an extinct art, which the elderly Unding would like to pass on to both of his grandchildren. Children take their first lessons from the village elders before starting school at the age of seven. Unding carries a master craftsman's piece on his shoulder. He has worked for six months on this blowing tube, fashioned from plain iron wood. The two four-year-old boys are feverish with impatience as they prepare to go into action for the first time. Who wants to be disgraced by Grandpa? The ancestral road goes deep into the jungle. Even if the arrows are no longer poisonous, they can easily hit an eye, a trick which secured survival in former times. Naturally, I learned the blow tube shooting from my father and my grandfather. At the time, we could only set traps with the blowing tubes. The so-called durian looks something like a large chestnut. Today it is not eaten, but used instead as a target poison. The arrow is handmade from light palm wood and can fly up to 40 meters. Blowing needs to be experienced. A two meter length of pipe, the equipment is nearly twice as long as its users. <laughs> but it seems to be of no help at all. It's very important to learn to shoot with a blowing tube. Blowing tube shooting is not simple, but it secures survival in the jungle, and it can be used to hunt different animals. A direct hit. The 66-year-old is pleased, and the boys are learning fast. 
Orangutans live in two places, on the free hunting ground in Sumatra and here in the forest of Borneo. These primates are the genetically next related to humans, with a whopping 96% of hereditary factors shared. The orangutan's forest habitat is being ousted day by day for development. The orangutans are on endangered species lists worldwide. Some of the orphans are fortunate and are raised by humans. In the past, ape mothers were often killed to sell their babies to zoos or animal lovers. In 1963, the Malaysian government passed a law that forbids people to keep orangutans as domestic animals. If somebody finds an orphan in the rainforest, they must immediately inform the rangers. They can otherwise face high fines or even imprisonment. Last year, the rangers found 10 ape babies. They brought them to the Sepilok Orangutan Reha Cantione, one of three centers worldwide. The way to freedom leads first behind the center's latticework. Every newcomer is subjected to a 90-day quarantine to avoid the spread of infections. First, rangers give each orangutan a name. This is Toby. He is three months old and is scrubbed once a week. It takes 10 years before the animals can be led back to their natural habitat. Orangutan babies are very similar to human babies. Toby is completely dependent upon human warmth and care in his first years. Although they need the help, orangutan babies should not get too much attached to male nurses such as Betty. Of course, I feel like their father. They only want to be hugged. But orangutans belong to the wild, and I'm very much aware of that. We are here for this very reason. The Sepilok Orangutan Reha Center was founded in 1964. It is a fact that the orangutan animal species has become extremely threatened. Orangutans are included in Sabah's curricula. Many children come here and see orangutans for the first time. Visitors are allowed twice a day, always while the animals are being fed. Dr. Zen is a veterinary surgeon and has worked in the national park for several years. Long after the animals have gone back into the wild, Dr. Zen continues to keep a record of their health conditions. According to him, there are just 10,000 orangutans in Sabah. A uh, hundred years ago, you could find orangutans basically all around Sabah. Okay, then due to habitat loss, the area of where the orangutans have shrunk to just covering the east coast of Sabah. And that's in fact quite a small area compared to its uh, previous distribution a hundred years ago. 3.2 kilos, huh? Eh? Yeah. Many young animals are discovered only after wandering motherless in the jungle for several days. Their health conditions will have weakened accordingly. Baby orangutans, like humans, are highly susceptible to teething diseases. Often a single quarantine is enough. You okay? You okay now? The food plan consists of bananas and milk. In the jungle, all alone, the helpless babies wouldn't have a chance of survival. Toby, like many other animals, will go through a two-part training program. Humans must teach orangutans to run and climb and still no mastery gained without exercises.
Every metre of rope brings them closer to freedom. It takes a long time for the young animals to learn to climb. Bedi does intensive training for three to four years with the animals. Surviving on the hunting grounds isn't easy, and Bedi must be constantly active. Only hard work is praised. Bedi knows the difference between reluctance and inability. I love young orangutans most of all. They still follow my lead. The older ones are much more difficult to discipline. It's easy to see how far the animals have come as a result of the daily climbing exercises. Those who need to reach the top need a green light from Bedi. Being dependable doesn't seem to be enough. Those who are allowed to go outdoors for the first time have nearly made it to freedom. The contrived environment here is comparable to their natural habitat. And the survival techniques they have learned are put to a test. If they do well, they might just get to grow up to be a ripe, old 60-year-old living in the wild. In nature, the animals live exclusively in trees. They build nests from tall branches and sleep soundly at cozy heights high above the jungle floor. The orangutan's first few nights spent outdoors were spent in cages for safety purposes. Orangutans are loners. During the period when they get used to the wild, the animals live together and learn by imitating each other. The older animals adopt jungle beginners and look after them. Only the young ones get a daily milk ration. Afterwards, they are given bananas. A permanent nutrition supply is likely to distract the animals from foraging independently for their food. Sepilok has five training stations in total. The first is very close to the rehabilitation center, whereas the last is situated deep in the jungle. The adaptation process ends at this last station. The animals remain independent for some of their time there, adjusting to a life of freedom. Ranger Dusain feeds them once or twice a day. My little scoundrels don't come every time. I call them, shouting again and again, but they simply don't follow me. At that point, I get angry, because they must come through that last training to get accustomed to the jungle. Only then can they be set free. The ape mother, Ragi, has completed her adaptation program. Ragi is moving out now and will go to the forest with her three-month-old baby. In Sepilok, orangutans have learned the most necessary survival know-how and that is what they urgently need. Pessimistic estimations warn us that this animal species has about 20 more years left before its total extinction.